Hello and welcome to Mayor Brown's webinar, Cumex Issues. My name is Chris Chapman and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's London office. Joining me today as co-presenters are my colleagues Chris Roberts in London, Kelly Kramer in Washington DC, Jan Cryvanger in Frankfurt and Joy Deeps in Gupta in Paris. Before we begin, I'd like to go through some housekeeping points. First, at the bottom of your screen, you will notice there are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of these widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to make the most of your desktop space. We are streaming this program through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please ensure your speakers or headsets are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear us. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection, preferably with Chrome or Firefox browsers, and closing any programs or browsers running in the background that may cause interference. If your slides do stop moving along, press the F5 key on your keyboard. That's F5 or refresh the page. If you have any additional questions about technical problems, Answers to common technical problems can be found in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. We invite you to submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature on the platform, and we will try to get through all of the questions at the end. If we run out of time, we will do our best to follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. Regarding CLE credits for US attendees, we will be providing an alphanumeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. And on that note, let's get started. Phew, that was quite a long introduction. I'm sorry about that. Um, right, so we're here today to discuss Cummix. This group um, last gave a presentation on this in, I think, October last year, uh, and we wanted to update on some recent developments. Um, and, lo and like our presentation in October, uh, our objective here is really just to try and think about um, some emerging issues and some future developments, um, and really uh, to try and help think about how we can all sort of deal with and manage these risks. Um, so that the outline of the seminar today, it, we're going to we're going to begin with Jan, who's going to um, talk about some recent developments in Germany. Um, and then Joy Deep will talk about some recent developments in Denmark. Chris Roberts will then talk about some recent developments in the UK. Kelly will give us a US perspective. Um, and then I'm going to try and think about what that all means and what might happen next, and we'll end with some questions. Um, now, if we just move on to the next slide, uh, and before I hand over to Jan, I did just want to touch on what we mean when we're talking about Cummex today. Uh, and of course, the most recent and high profile um, form this has taken in Europe has been in Germany. Uh, which has seen some schemes which were designed to exploit some tax loopholes to allow investors to claim multiple tax withholding credits uh, in relation to a single dividend. So really to, to claim um, uh, many multiples of tax refunds when tax has only been paid a single time. Um, this all ha started happening in Germany or became an issue in Germany actually several years ago. And, and, and these sorts of issues have been around for much longer than that. I, I think I'm right that the US had its own Cummex type problem in the 1990s. Um, but we want to talk today about some uh, other issues emerging around Europe and elsewhere um, on the subject. And, and I think not just in relation to Cummex in a strict sense, we'll also talk at least a little bit about some similar sorts of issues um, that might emerge in other jurisdictions. So with that um, introduction, I will now hand over to Jan. Thank you, Chris. Um, so in our last webinar in October 2020, 
Um, I have given an overview of the status quo in the areas of the tax courts, the civil courts and the criminal courts. Um, so I will keep this distinction and inform you on updates in each of these areas. Um, so first, the criminal um, courts. Um, it has been reported that in Germany around 900 individuals are investigated, uh, most of them bankers, brokers and lawyers. Um, around 130 banks are included in these investigations. Um, just to name the most prominent cases, um, first the Regional Court of Bonn. Uh, by way of a, a reminder, in March 2020, the Regional Court of Bonn handed down a landmark decision condemning two former traders of HVB for tax evasion in an amount of 400 million euros. In addition, the court ordered the financial institution MM Warburg, which had acted as short buyer in the scheme, to pay back tax returns in an amount of 176 million euros. The bank has appealed against this judgment to the Federal Supreme Court and this appeal is still pending. Uh, then in January 2021, the Regional Court of Bonn um, confirmed to open a second trial, this time in particular against Hanno Berger, a tax lawyer and central figure in the Cum-Ex scam, as well as against a high-ranked banker of MM Warburg. The tax damage is estimated at 278 million euros. Then the next complex uh, is with the Regional Court of Wiesbaden. Uh, already in December 2019, um, this court had approved criminal proceedings against six individuals, uh, namely Hanno Berger, uh, then Paul Mora a high-ranked London-based banker at HVB. Uh, then the two HVB traders who had already been convicted in Bonn. Uh, and then in addition, uh, two German private client advisors of HVB. So the proceedings against the two HVB traders uh, who have been convicted in Bonn um, have been separated and postponed due to Corona travel restrictions um, because the accused live in Ireland and Gibraltar. Um, then the proceedings against Paul Mora have been separated and postponed too uh, because he has fled to New Zealand in the meantime. Um, in October 2020, the Wiesbaden court issued an arrest warrant against Hanno Berger. Um, Mr. Berger has also fled. Um, he went to Switzerland when his premises were dawn raided about eight years ago. Mr. Berger appealed, um, but the arrest warrant was upheld by the Frankfurt Court of Appeal. Most notably, the court ruled that cum ex trading did not only constitute tax evasion, but also a so-called so professional gang fraud. This means that the perpetrators formed a gang in order to commit fraud on an ongoing and professional basis. Such offense is punishable with up to 10 years imprisonment. This finding of the Frankfurt Court of Appeal is important in so far as Switzerland does honor arrest warrants for fraud while it does not extradite for tax evasion. So there's some chance that Switzerland will accept the arrest warrant and extradite Mr. Berger in near future. In its decision, the court also said that Berger had made profits of around 113 million euros, uh, which were split between the gang members. On uh, 25 March, 2021, uh, the trial commenced against Berger and the two former advisors of HVB without Berger present. 
However, in the hearing, it was decided to separate and postpone the proceedings against Mr. Berger. Uh, and so for the time being, the trial is continued only with the two HVB private client advisors. Uh, next slide, please. So the next complex uh, regards the Regional Court of Frankfurt. Um, the proceedings in Frankfurt um, regard the cum ex rating of Maple Bank. Uh, the tax damage is set to be 346 million euros. Um, and in this complex, proceedings are initiated against former directors of Maple Bank two former Freshfields partners and the law firm Freshfields itself. The trial against five former directors of Maple Bank started on 17 May 2021, so just yesterday, um, and the court has scheduled 20 trial days until September 21. The proceedings against the two former Freshfields partners, as well as one further director of Maple Bank, have been separated and postponed due to Corona, and it is unclear when their trial will start. Um, also, the public prosecutor has terminated the proceedings against Freshfields before the law firm had paid 10 million euros to the tax office without admission of fault. Um, then Regional Court of Hamburg. Um, the Hamburg public prosecutor has charged the British investment banker San Sanjay Shah and six further individuals from London and Dubai with 55 counts of money laundering. The public prosecutor alleges that the money involved in these criminal acts amounts to more than half a billion euros and that this money stems from cum ex trades to the detriment of the Danish and Belgian treasury. Mr. Shaw is also facing prosecution in Denmark, where he has been charged for causing a damage of more than 1.2 billion euro to the Danish treasury. Next slide, please. So um, Vichaya Sanka. Mr. Sanka is a hedge fund employee located in the UK. Um, the Cologne public prosecutor initiated an extradition request against him, which Mr. Sanka objected. However, his resistance was dismissed by judges in both the High Administrative Court in January and then in early February in the Westminster Magistrate Court. After a two days hearing, um, the judges ruled that the extradition cannot be halted because of Brexit, as the European arrest warrant was issued before Britain left the European Union. This decision is interesting because London-based traders played a major role in the Cum-Ex scandal. And it is to be expected that further extradition requests will be made to the UK authorities in future. Um, then Lehman Brothers, um, it has been reported in January 2021 um, that the insolvency ad, uh, administrator of Lehman Brothers has agreed to pay profits to the treasury the bank had made with cum ex trades in an amount of around 50 million euro. This is remarkable because Lehman had not claimed and received any withholding tax from the tax office, but Lehman had rather acted as short seller in the, in the trades. Uh, then further criminal investigations and dawn raids are ongoing. Uh, in particular, the Frankfurt public prosecutor continues um, his investigations in cum ex trades of DZ Bank, Commerzbank and Hilaba. Uh, and for instance, in March 21, the Frankfurt public prosecutor dawn rated eight offices and six private homes with more than 90 police officers involved. Um, the investigations concern two new COMEX complexes 
involving seven individuals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now we are turning to the civil courts. Um, the players in the Cum-Ex scam continue to sue each other as well as their advisors. Um, you see here some of the most uh, prominent uh, cases listed on this slide, um, which I will not read out to you in detail. So the tax courts, um, here has been no new development. Uh, there's still an appeal pending with the Federal Fiscal Court. Uh, and that actually means um, that the question, if Cum-Ex was illegal at all, has still not been answered by the highest German tax court. Um, then on top, we also have um, new legislation. Um, in the end of 2020, the legislator has expanded the minimum prescription period for so-called specially serious tax evasion from 10 years to 15 years. Uh, this period is interrupted and starts from the beginning, for instance, if the perpetrator is informed that criminal proceedings are commenced. The maximum possible prescription period is now 37.5 years after the crime has been committed. This extension applies to all offenses which have not been prescribed by the time the law came into existence. In addition, in case a conviction, in case of a, um, in addition, in case of a conviction, the proceeds can be confiscated even after the tax claim of the tax office has prescribed. So even 10 years after the tax loophole for cum ex trades has been closed, criminal charges will not be time barred. And I would not be surprised if in five years the prescription periods will be expanded for another time. Many thanks. Thanks, uh, Jan, for, for the uh, very uh, thorough description of what's going on in, in Germany. Um, my name is Joydeep Singupta. I'm in the uh, Compliance Investigations and Regulatory Practice in Paris at Mayor Brown, um, and I'll pick up on some of the very interesting developments taking place in Denmark. Uh, and to start us off, uh, we thought it was appropriate to, to uh, cite to Shakespeare and Hamlet, uh, something is rotten in the state of Denmark, which is interesting for two reasons. One, um, obviously the link to England uh, in all of these Danish cases, and also because uh, all of these developments are in, involve a lot of dramatic and colorful characters. Um, so if, what we do today, we thought we would take you through some of the chronology, uh, starting all the way back in 2010 um, to today, and then talk about uh, what that means for you, wherever you may be in the world. Um, and what, what the impact of some of these uh, very aggressive Danish, Danish um, uh, enforcement actions might mean for your business. So we go back uh, in time to 2010. So over 10 years ago, uh, there was an audit report uh, on the Danish Ministry of Taxation, which signaled um, a warning that, that there could be these potential loopholes that were being exploited um, for dividend withholding tax refunds. Um, at the time, uh, this report was uh, ignored. Uh, we find out about it later in some of the civil litigation that has, has started uh, in later years. Uh, fast forward to 2015, um, as Jan mentioned, Sanjay Shah, the central character in, in a lot of these, these uh, cases, is identified for the first time publicly in Denmark as a prime suspect um, for having defrauded the Danish tax authorities um, between 2012 and 2015. Some of these, uh, as Jan mentioned, some of these schemes went on you know, through different time periods and, and involving different parties. Um, so obviously the case of the activities didn't end in 2015, but it triggered uh, the first uh, beginning of, of the investigation in Denmark. Um, at the same time, uh, Norway and Belgium, two other jurisdictions where similar schemes were in play, 
were alerted and they were effectively stopped um, not soon, not too late thereafter. So as a result, Denmark suffered you know, bigger losses than, than these two other countries. Uh, fast forward to 2017, um, investigation is still ongoing in Denmark. No one has been criminally charged. Uh, two suspected co-conspirators are identified by the Danish authorities. Uh, in some of the schemes in Denmark, uh, there was a, there's also a link with the U.S. pension funds, which Kelly will talk about later in this presentation. Um, and some of the allegations inc include setting up fictitious uh, pension funds, which were then used as vehicles to claim these tax refunds. Next slide, please. Um, then fast forward to 2018. Uh, some really interesting developments. Um, so Sanjay Shah, who is the interesting character that that Jan had introduced us in Germany, um, he was a British trader who had set up uh, his own uh, investment fund in 2008 after the financial crisis. He had previously been um, a banker with several U.S. banks and and Rabobank, um, and. He since 2009 he had been living in uh, Dubai, and and Dubai is interesting because of some of the implications of that jurisdiction on the Danish cases. Um, so fast forward 2018, Shah is now living in Dubai. Uh, the Danish Ministry of Taxation files a civil lawsuit in the UK against two companies tied to Shah, and Chris will talk. Chris Roberts will talk about uh, these cases later on. Um, making a claim that it's a victim of fraud, conspiracy, dishonesty, and unjust enrichment. Default judgment is is issued against uh, these two companies, and asset freezes um, in the UK of these entities tied to Shah. Um, the Danish authorities at the same time uh, file civil cases against Shah in Dubai International Financial Centre courts and in London. Um, so, separately from the entities that he's involved with, he is individually also charged in, in the civil cases. Um, some of these cases involve requesting access to financial documents uh, in connection with the companies that he controlled. Um, also in 2018, you see the beginning of the asset freezes across uh, the UK, Germany, UAE. Uh, in the UK, I believe there were some um, properties as well, physical properties that were that were uh, generating income for Shah, and almost $660 million of assets are frozen, but they're not confiscated. Next slide, please. Um, so next in 2019, uh, we see uh, by which time the Danish authorities have started very aggressive civil lawsuits around the world, including um, multiple lawsuits against U.S. pension funds, which which Kelly will talk about. Um, and we have the first settlement in 2019 of, of almost $239 million to settle these tax fraud cases. Um, Another entity, which is a German bank called North Channel Bank, uh, is fined by the Danish court of Glostrup for facilitating uh, fraudulent tax refunds. So again, this was a, a German bank that acted as an intermediary uh, in connection with some of Shah's schemes um, and had generated almost $55 million of, of fees. So, uh, the, it's, it's, so if you look at the cast of characters that the Danish authorities are going after, it's the intermediaries, it's the individuals, it's the co-conspirators getting access to um, to funds, and it kind of speaks volumes of, of how seriously the authorities are taking uh, this case and the kind of dogged persistence starting from 2015 as, as they start moving around the world and, and going after uh, potential defendants. Um, there is then an unfortunate ruling for, for Shah in 2019 where um, the Danish authorities successfully gain access to millions of documents. And it's interesting because even through 2019, they don't appear to have sufficient evidence of, of fraud and intentional fraud. So the, the, the idea here being that they, they would use some of these documents generated um, by, the, by the investment fund controlled by Shah to then develop the criminal case against him in, in Denmark. Um, at this time, 476 lawsuits had already been initiated. So you can imagine the volume of, of uh, legal resources that were being expended by Denmark uh, already by 2019. Um, in 2019, Jan mentioned briefly some of the extradition issues here, and it's very interesting. Um, this is also coming up in, in other cases where, where UK defendants are, are being sought within Europe, but also outside of the EU. 
Um, and here, both Denmark and UK agreed that any potential pros criminal prosecution should take place in Denmark. Um, but the complication there becomes uh, the fact that Denmark does not extradite um, its own citizens or, or UAE nationals to UAE because of human rights concerns, uh, I believe death penalty related concerns for certain offenses. So as Denmark is not reciprocal in its extradition uh, relations with the UAE, Shah is, is unlikely to be extradited. Next slide, please. Um, continuing in, in 2019, uh, he continues to this day, to, Shah denies wrongdoing in the civil cases, um, uh, but he does submit to a voluntary interview to Danish authorities in Abu Dhabi in September. In 2020, uh, again, a stroke of bad luck for the Danes, the Dubai court in the first instance dismisses the Danish government claim that it had been defrauded uh, by Shah, citing lack of evidence. Uh, and this, this is a challenge, uh, partly because the defense strategy uh, from Shah has always been focused on the fact that what they were doing were perfectly legal. Um, obviously, Jan mentioned, you know, fresh fields and other law firms and accounting firms have been involved, and many of them had previously given advice that, that this scheme was legal. It was just exploiting a legal loophole. Um, the next um, uh, development then is, is the appellate court also dismisses this lawsuit, uh, which is a blow for, for the Danes. Next slide, please. Um, now we're in 2021. Um, the Danish authorities in January of this year finally criminally charged Shah um, for, for defrauding the tax authorities. Uh, and as of now, we have over 500 lawsuits against individuals, organizations, not just in Denmark, but in the UK, the US, UAE, Germany, Malaysia, Canada. Um, and we don't know how many more will come. So that just shows uh, the, the strategy that's being used uh, by the Danish authorities. Um, most recently in April of this year, you have three more U UK nationals that are tied to as, as former associates or employees or, or, or tied to related entities of Shah and three Americans uh, connected to certain pension funds, I believe, have been charged by Danish prosecutors. Um, and all of this is taking place against the backdrop of the UK civil litigation that Chris Roberts will talk about. Um, the FCA investigation into the investment fund of Shah, which is really interesting because we have the first um, uh, penalty issued by the FCA, which could uh, give us some clues as to what might happen in other European jurisdictions. Um, and as Jan mentioned, the pre-Brexit extradition requests for UK nationals that are, that are being sought by Germany. Next slide, please. So what, what does it all mean for you, wherever in the world you may be, in the US or, or let's say in France or, or in Asia, um, what does this mean? So first, looking at the scale of these lawsuits, the civil uh, litigation primarily, um, Denmark has already spent, I believe, $350 million uh, uh, in, in legal fees as well as consulting fees in bringing these cases. So it just shows, given the, the, the tremendous uh, pressure uh, being faced by the tax authorities and, and the harm done to their, their treasury, uh, that they've taken a very, very aggressive strategy um, and tremendous cooperation with authorities across the world. You also have the staggering volume of cases, and you know, in some instances, people have speculated whether this is a sort of a shock and awe strategy, uh, which can pressure certain uh, defendants to either provide evidence that they're lacking in terms of proving the fraud and the conspiracy uh, or strengthening those charges in, in for other defendants, including Shah, um, and then pushing for settlements like the one they had with the US pension funds. Um, what, what could be the potential areas of exposure? Obviously, the obvious ones, the criminal offenses uh, for the people directly tied. Um, as more evidence comes in, uh, recall millions of documents uh, have now been obtained by the Danish authorities based on the lawsuit in, in Dubai. So that could potentially identify other actors in the chain, could be custodians, settlement agents, um, European and other investment banks issues with compliance and money laundering obligations. Um, so as, as we mentioned in our last um, webinar, the EBA uh, has issued several uh, useful pieces of guidance on, on potential money laundering risks uh, tied to this scheme of QMEX. Um, and so we could expect uh, enforcement actions by national regulatory authorities. 
Um, compliance with securities market regulations. Again, the ESMA, the European Securities uh, Markets Authority, has issued guidance last year uh, with regards to some of the, the, the concerns. Uh, so potential viol violations could face uh, regulatory enforcement. Um, and then risk of financial crime prevention failures uh, leading to penalties, which is interestingly, most recently, which has happened with Saipan Capital, um, the investment fund in the UK that has first faced the first uh, QMEX related penalty this year. And of course, the civil proceedings to recover losses. Um, and Chris Chapman will talk about this in the end, but some of the issues, if you're tied to Denmark, if what could you be doing as a financial institution? Um, so obviously, the first step would be to identify what your exposure could be. Are, are there any of these Danish defendants that have been named uh, in these public lawsuits uh, tied to any of your client base or any intermediaries that your financial institution may have dealt with? Um, and the second uh, consideration, uh, which many institutions have already started, is considering doing a privileged internal investigation into some of the historic transactions to the extent that you've identified any ties to the defendant individuals and companies. And uh, finally, uh, considering any compliance or mediation measures or regulatory disclosures that may be necessary, um, obviously based on consultation with your counsel. Passing on to Chris Roberts. So I'm going to deal with two very recent key developments in the UK. First, a high court judgment in the litigation brought by the Danish Tax Authority and a recent decision by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority against a brokerage firm involved in the Cumex scandal. So the Danish Tax Authority, SCAT, has brought a claim in the English High Court to try to recover £1.5 billion that it alleges represents the proceeds of unlawful and fraudulent reclaiming of tax as a result of Cumex schemes. The claim has been brought against 114 defendants, including the individual who we've already heard quite a lot about today, who has been described as the mastermind of the Cumex schemes, Mr. Sanjay Shah, and one of his companies, Solo Capital Partners. This claim has been described as unprecedented in scale. It has been listed for three separate trials. First, a one-week revenue rule trial of one preliminary issue, which took place in March 2021. Second, a six-week trial called the validity trial in relation to other preliminary issues. And third, a quite frankly massive trial to start in January 2023 and continue for over a year until March 2024. As I said, in March this year, the first trial, the revenue rule trial, took place and judgment was handed down on the 27th of April. This was to determine the preliminary issue of whether or not SCAT's claim offended the revenue rule. Now, the revenue rule is an English common law rule which holds that English courts have no jurisdiction to entertain either, one, an action for the enforcement, directly or indirectly, of a penal revenue or other public law of a foreign state, or two, an action founded upon an act of state. The rationale for the rule is that, under the common law, Assertions of sovereign authority cannot be made by one state within the territory of another. And for reference, the revenue rule is also sometimes called Dicey Rule 3. For the High Court, the case law was clear that it did not matter how the state in question framed its claim. What mattered was the effect of the claim. Here, SCAT had framed its claims in various ways including, as Joy Deep said earlier, fraud and conspiracy to defraud. But the court found that the Danish Withholding Tax Act was at the heart of SCAT's case. Without it, none of SCAT's claims could be formulated. Under the terms of the Act, a non-Danish entity receiving a dividend from a Danish company could apply to claim from SCAT the percentage of the dividend withheld and paid to SCAT. The defendants argued that making tax refund payments was an integral part of SCAT's function as a sovereign tax authority, and its entitlement to make those tax refund payments derived from its power to tax Danish company dividends. The court agreed, 
finding that all of SCAT's claims were in substance claims seeking to enforce in the UK Denmark's sovereign right to tax dividends declared by Danish companies. The court therefore held that SCAT's claims offended the revenue rule and the claim should be dismissed. This was the case even where SCAT's claims were characterised as civil and commercial matters under the terms of the Brussels Regulation Recast and Lugano Convention as the basis for the English courts having jurisdiction. SCAT has been granted permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal, so this preliminary issue will continue. Indeed, it could potentially be litigated to the UK Supreme Court. The permission to appeal is apparently limited at this stage to the point about whether the revenue rule applies even when claims are classified as commercial and civil matters under the Brussels Re Regulation Recast and Lugano Convention, rather than in relation to the revenue rule itself, but that may change. The court did also speculate that SCAT might take advantage of international cooperation agreements, such as the EU's Mutual Assistance Recovery Directive and the US-Denmark Double Taxation Agreement. The court did identify that SCAT could use the US-Denmark Double Taxation Agreement to obtain information from the IRS in connection with SCAT's claims to the extent it had not already done so. Importantly, it appears from the judgment that the IRS has confirmed to SCAT its view that information relevant to SCAT's claims would be captured by the terms of the US-Denmark Double Taxation Agreement. So it seems in principle at least that the IRS is willing to share relevant information with SCAT about entities and individuals in the US involved in, in COMEX schemes. Whether it will share such information with the tax authorities in other jurisdictions would depend upon the presence and terms of any double taxation agreement between that jurisdiction and the US. So the litigation by SCAT is the most visible and high profile manifestation in England of the effects of the COMEX scandal. But this has been brought against some of the individuals and entities seen as central to that scandal, at least as far as SCAT is concerned. What about entities who might have been involved in dealing with or processing necessary transactions under the COMEX schemes, but who were not movers or shakers in them? Well, the UK's Financial Conduct Authority has taken regulatory action against just such an entity. On 6th of May 2021, the FCA issued a final notice against Sapien Capital Limited. Sapien executed over-the-counter equity trades for entities that were introduced to it by what the FCA called the Solo Group. The Solo Group were entities owned by Mr Shah, including Solo Capital Partners, both of which are defendants in the claim by SCAT that we've just been talking about. The entities introduced to Sapien Capital by the Solo Group were called the Solo Clients. The Solo Clients were incorporated in the BVI and in the Cayman Islands, plus were involved, sorry, start again. The entities introduced to Sapien Capital by the Solo Group were called the Solo Clients. The Solo Clients were incorporated in the BVI and Cayman Islands, plus a number of individual US 401k pension plans. The equity trades Sapien executed for the Solo Clients totaled approximately £2.5 billion in Danish equities and £3.8 billion in Belgian equities. For these services, Sapien Capital received gross commission of £297,000. The FCA said that between the 10th of February 2015 and the 10th of November 2015, Sapien had inadequate systems and controls to identify and mitigate the risk of being used to facilitate fraudulent trading and money laundering in relation to business introduced by the Solo Group. And it did not exercise due skill, care and diligence, both in applying its AML policies and procedures and in failing properly to assess, monitor and mitigate the risk of financial crime in relation to the Solo clients and their purported trading. As a result, the FCA fined Sapien £178,000. It said it would have fined Sapien £236,700, though this was reduced due to a combination of a cooperation discount and Sapien evidencing that the fine would cause serious financial hardship. The FCA looked at various issues and found the way that the purported trades were conducted in combination with their scale and volume was, in its view, highly suggestive of financial crime. 
The factors the FCA considered included, amongst others, first, the solo group introduced 166 solo clients to Sapien, though at the time Sapien had only 30 to 40 active clients. And in doing so, Sapien cut corners by bypassing its standard KYC forms and compliance manual and failing to review the KYC materials which were provided and failing to follow up on red flags. Second, the trading of the solo clients demonstrated a circular pattern of transactions involving EU equities on the last day of cum dividend before the same trades were subsequently purportedly reversed over several days or weeks. Third, the trades by the solo clients were purportedly traded and settled by the solo group via a closed network, and the solo clients were controlled by a small number of individuals without apparent access to funds to settle the transactions. Fourth, despite not having access to liquidity from public exchanges, the purported trades were filled within a matter of minutes and represented up to 20% of the shares outstanding in the companies listed on the Danish stock exchange and up to 10% of the companies listed on the Belgian stock exchange. And fifth, the volumes equated to an average of 20 times the total number of all shares traded in the Danish stocks on European exchanges and 25 times the uh, total number of Belgian stocks traded on European exchanges on the relevant last cum dividend trading date. The FCA stated that the purpose of the purported trading was so the solo group could arrange for dividend credit advice slips to be created, which purported to show that the solo clients held the relevant shares on the record date for the dividend. These advice slips were in some cases then used to make withholding tax reclaims from the tax agencies in Denmark and Belgium pursuant to double taxation treaties. Apparently, the Danish and Belgian tax authorities paid out approximately £846 million and £42 million, respectively, pursuant to these arrangements. This FCA final notice demonstrates how organisations that were involved in facilitating the COMEX schemes, even if they did not greatly profit from them, can be and are being investigated and fined, namely inadequate systems to identify and prevent money laundering and other financial crime. Whilst the factors in this matter would appear to be particularly egregious, entities such as brokers would be advised to look back to understand what, if any, involvement they may have had to the COMEX schemes, no matter how inadvertent, including the scale of activity in which they were engaged, no matter the gross profits generated. The FCA said in February this year that it was investigating eight individuals and 14 firms for their involvement in a dividend trading strategy. So as I said at the start of this section, there are 114 defendants in this SCAT claim in the English High Court alone, and that relates only to claims in England by the Danish tax authority. So as we all appreciate, this COMEX scandal is not only broad, but has many layers. I am now going to hand over to Kelly, who is going to deal with uh, issues in the US. Kelly. Thanks, gentlemen, for the update. There's obviously quite a lot going on in Europe, the situation is quieter in the United States, at least on the surface. Just to recap, in our last webinar, we predicted that the U.S. courts and law enforcement authorities would play at least four different roles in these investigations. In short, we expected to see civil litigation in the U.S., as well as cooperation by U.S. law enforcement in connection with the various European probes that we've discussed today. And we also flagged the potential for criminal charges and civil security charges in the United States. Since that last webinar, we've seen some developments on at least two of those fronts. Next slide. First, let me give you a quick update on the CUMEX litigation pending in the United States. The biggest case at the moment continues to be the Danish tax authorities' efforts to recoup about $2.8 billion in losses from U.S. pension funds. The case is pending in the Southern District of New York, and the complaint has already withstood a serious motion to dismiss predicated on the revenue rule. Uh, as Chris Roberts explained earlier, that's the same rule that the UK courts recently relied upon when dismissing the, uh, the similar Danish claims in the UK. So perhaps that makes the US courts a more attractive option for countries like Germany and Belgium that may be interested in pursuing similar civil claims. Right now, the SCAT tax refund scheme litigation is in a discovery phase. Currently, the parties are seeking, and for the most part obtaining, permission to, to get evidence uh, from the UK and Denmark. It'll be interesting to see how this case plays out because obviously 
relevant evidence is likely scattered all over the world. The next big pleading cycle, at least on the merits, is probably still months, if not a year or so away, as the summary judgment motions probably won't be filed until after the close of discovery. Second, let me speak briefly about actions by the U.S. authorities involving requests for assistance from foreign authorities. And in that regard, we have seen at least some activity as it relates to these foreign investigations. For example, we know from the decision in the U.K. case that Chris discussed that the United States has been sharing information with other authorities pursuant to various tax treaties. That's not surprising, and we expect that sort of cooperation will continue. What is a bit more interesting is the potential for the U.S. to get involved with extradition. Now, there have already been some rulings in extradition matters in the U.K., but we're not aware of any public cumex related extradition requests to the United States. But it sure looks like one is coming. In particular, last month, Danish authorities filed criminal charges against six more people. Three of the defendants are U.S. citizens. Three are U.K. citizens. According to the prosecutor, the charges allege that the defendants engaged in fictitious stock trades involving 27 U.S. pension plans. Now, sometimes in these international cases, we see a criminal charge, but no real effort to extradite. That doesn't seem to be the case here. When the Danish prosecutors filed the charges, they spoke to the media, saying that the defendants faced 8 to 12 years in prison. And the prosecutor put out a pointed, pointed statement. It's quoted on the slide. It's hard to read this as anything other than a warning that the Danish authorities will pursue extradition. That gets us to an interesting aspect of all of these cases. Unlike, say, in the 1MDB case, where you have fugitives in China, the potential defendants here are mostly European and North American bankers or traders. The U.S. has extradition treaties with all of the countries that are actively pursuing criminal cases at the moment, including Denmark, Belgium, and Germany. And unlike many countries, the U.S. is willing to extradite its nationals when the treaty requirements are met. So the question becomes, would those treaties allow for the extradition of U.S. citizens for COMEX-related trading schemes? It isn't crystal clear. All of these treaties have dual criminality provisions, so it's possible that a U.S.-based defendant might be able to convince a U.S. court that the allegations against them wouldn't make out a crime under U.S. law. But I wouldn't bet on that. The case law and extradition issues tend to be a little thin, but the weight of authority suggests that U.S. courts likely would extradite a U.S.-based defendant who faces foreign tax evasion or foreign fraud charges. This is going to be another interesting area to watch. From a defendant's perspective, extradition is not much fun. For example, there are presumptions against pre-extradition release, so a defendant is likely to be held in custody while the extradition proceedings work their way through the courts. As a practical matter, some defendants may try to test the dual criminality argument. Others may very well decide to appear voluntarily so that they can secure better pretrial release terms. And with that, I'm going to kick it back to Chris. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, if we could have the next slide. Um, so I'm just going to try and speak for a few minutes about what might be coming next, and then we're going to have time for some questions. Um, and, and I suppose um, the, the starting point uh, for me is that many of us have been working on Cummex issues for several years, but I don't think many of us predicted, at least at the start, that we would be seeing this size of increase and in spread in the issues um, uh, so far down the track. Um, and that's a trend that we think is going to continue. And to us, that's the main risk uh, to try to manage. And we're seeing at the moment um, growth in, I guess, what we might think of as three different areas. So one is the increasing number of third parties and service providers that are being pulled into investigations and litigation. So we've talked about all of the different initiatives ongoing in Germany. Uh, we've discussed the number and size of litigation in Denmark. We've talked a bit about the number of defendants in that new case in the UK. Um, and we're not really just talking here about the bad actors, right? We're not talking about the people who set up the schemes. We're not even talking just about the people who structured them or advised on them. Uh, people who've only been involved in a very ancillary way are getting pulled in. So people who just provided services to these people without even knowing what they're doing. So 
you know, that includes all types of financial services providers. So it includes broker dealers, it includes custodians, it includes prime brokers. Um, it includes lawyers, not just lawyers who advised, you know, on the sp specific transactions, but lawyers who maybe provided quite ancillary advice, you know, auditors. You know, these are the sorts of people that are now getting pulled into the issues. Um, and that's partly because you know, over the last 10 years, if you think about it, there's been quite an evolution in the way regulators and law enforcement agencies think about service providers. So it's it's no longer enough if you're a financial services firm, of course, just to, to stop wrongdoing within your firm. You know, increasingly you are relied on to spot wrongdoing by your customers and counterparties. And we're really seeing a lot of that increasingly in other areas as well with auditors. And and we expect this trend um, of more and more parties being pulled in to continue, not least because, of course, of all of the documents that are being produced in the ongoing initiatives. So they will produce new names um, and new routes for uh, investigators and claimants to pursue. So that's one area. The other area is um, the evolution of what's happening in different jurisdictions. So that includes um, jurisdictions like Germany, where this has been a problem for a while. But, but Jan mentioned, you know, the German courts haven't even yet confirmed that the behaviour in Germany was illegal. And we often, we, when we talk to Jan, the thing we think about is, well, what will happen when that is confirmed, if it is confirmed? And you can imagine the floodgates opening for the German revenue. Um, and then there's sort of two types of jurisdictions to think about. So there's the, there's the jurisdictions like Germany who have this potential to be exploited within their tax structures. But that is not every jurisdiction in the world, but it is others that haven't yet become big issues. Denmark's an example where it has, but there are others out there and they may not all have strict German Cummex style issues. They may have something quite different, but still open to that sort of exploitation. And the other key jurisdictions are jurisdictions like um, the UK, for example. You know, the UK tax structure doesn't really give rise to this type of exploitation, but the UK has been the location for a number of the service providers. So, UK has been one of the most active jurisdictions for investigations. Um, and you know, if you are interested in mapping out the other jurisdictions where these may become issues, either because um, authorities, uh, regulators or enforcement agencies could take action where they haven't or where there are exploitable tax structures, um, then the European Securities and Markets Authority and the European Banking Authority have produced some interesting papers on this. Um, in particular, ESMA's September 2020 paper sort of lays out a bit of the landscape where these risks are emerging. And the third area and final area to think about is the international spread of civil litigation. Um, and in particular, you know, the spread to the US, which Kelly's just been talking about, you know, we know that is seen as a favorable jurisdiction for claimants for many reasons. You know, and we ex expect there may be more litigation in the US in the future, as well as in other jurisdictions. So that's the nature of the spread we're seeing. And you know how do we deal with that? How do you manage the risk of that? Well, Joy Deep mentioned um, a bit of this, and and when he was speaking. But look, look, one thing is don't assume that just because you know you were not acting on or advising on or directly involved with these sorts of schemes that that means you can't be pulled into the issues. Um, you've got to understand where any of your business might have touched upon these areas even very indirectly and then you really should think about the extent to which you need to get on top of the potential risks you know those of you who've been involved with investigations and this sort of litigation before will know the difference it can make if when you're first approached for questions you're prepared so you've properly understood what the issue is you've properly understood why it was you don't think you should be responsible for any bad behavior so really important to think about the level of understanding and investigation and preparation you might want to do from that perspective. And the other big thing I think is to just map out what is happening in different jurisdictions. So do, if you haven't already, get an understanding of the jurisdictions where this might 
be or become an issue for regulators um, and do, I think most importantly of all, um, get an understanding of the jurisdictions where this might be an issue for tax authorities and and be on top of it when those authorities start to become active. That That's the, the really big driver here um, is the, the, the tax authorities seeking to reimburse their revenues. And of course, you know, we're moving into a political environment now where there are quite likely to be a lot of revenues around the world that badly need that reimbursement following COVID. So I think that was, that's really our talk um, for now on the issues we've seen emerging and, and maybe what might happen in the future.